American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Never get married. That's my advice. Don't start. Don't get married. Don't start. Oh my god! <laughs> Don't you marriage? Begin. Is fucking pain in the ass. Oh my god! All right, all right, all right. All right. Oh, I can't take it anymore. All right, all right. Oh my right. god! It's You're a lot to handle. ASMR. <laughs> it's not ASMR. Oh, uh, what's ASMR? That is ASMR, but nobody wants to listen to or this me bitching about our marriage while you whisper. Yeah, that's ASMR. I guess. I don't know <laughs> if that's still a, a thing people do. I don't think they do. I saw one on TikTok the other day, but I haven't seen one in a long time. So dumb. It doesn't give you a boner? uh, No. People, there's probably naked ASMR. Gosh, we should Google that. All right. Let's let's get started. Ready? Yeah. Welcome to another episode of American Timelines. I'm Amy and that's Joe. And we're History for Jerks, the greatest outfit this side of the Mississippi. That's right. We've got a YouTube series called The Gruff Aloud Show. Featuring the great Gruff, a weed-loving guy that's mm-hmm. got a great philosophy on life, loves everything and everybody. We've got the Nerd School Podcast, a bunch of sexy nerds teaching me about the MCU, movie by movie. And we've got this show, American Timelines. Right. Featuring a super hot lady who I married, and I'm happy about the marriage. Let's, yeah. Hello. And she happens to love murders. Okay, and today we're going to talk about 1958. We are. And specifically November and December, right? This will be the last episode of 1958. And then we have probably six more episodes after this, and we'll be done with the 50s. And you've been hinting at we might be done. I don't know. We'll see. I, I, I have an idea of something, but... I've got an idea of some things we could do, too, instead of going to the 40s. We might. We've got some ideas of switching up the format. Every episode doesn't have to be the same format. We could do a couple sub series of American Timelines. Yes. I thought of today. Here's an idea I came up with today. The One Word Podcast. Each episode, we each only can say one word. <laughs> and we just say that word over and over for an hour. Oh, now. my God. Yeah. That's like idea? that's kind of like Smart. living with you anyway. Whoa. <laughs> What's the one word? I don't even know. Boobs? It changes. A lot of times it's boobs. No, I know it is. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, let's All right. get started. Jumping in November of 1958. Yes. I've right. got some murders. I've got <clears throat> crazy in November and December of 1958, multiple people died on TV and movie sets. Really? Yeah, it's weird. It's like a coincidence. Like that, the couple of months that there was all those crashes. And it's not like... None of them are related. Nor- it's weird. And normally people don't die a lot. Well, it's just heart sense. attacks. In the 50s, I guess everybody had a heart attack because all they, they drank and bacon grease. Steak and donuts sandwiches. Instead of water. <laughs> yeah. Steak, donuts, and cigarettes. With cigarettes on top. And then I drink bacon grease uh, instead much. of water. Like everybody carried around bacon grease bottles. All right. Let's move on. November 1st, 1958 was a Saturday. Mm-hmm. And the crash of the Cubana de Aviation Flight 495 killed 17 of the 20 people on board. Oh, so God, so some people survived. Three people survived. And this plane was hijacked by rebels during its flight from Miami in the U.S. to the vacation resort of Varadero in Cuba. The Vickers Viscount 755 apparently ran out of fuel and crashed on a beach at Punta Tobacco as it was approaching the airport for the village of Preston in Cuba. So that's one thing. If you're going to hijack a plane, make sure it's got enough fuel yeah. to the place you want to take it. This was the first ever international hijacking operation originating on U.S. soil. Really? Departing from Miami International Airport on November 1st, 1958. Uh Cubana Airlines flight was 495 was forced to attempt to land on a small airstrip in eastern Cuba, but it plunged into nearby Nipe Bay, I think, Mm -hmm. 
Uh, locals near the crash site remember the wreckage and the runway being too short for the four-engine prop jet. According to NBC, 14 people died in the crash and six survived. So uh, the original Wikipedia said 17 of the 20 died, but apparently six survived, including most of the hijackers oh who fled the crash and joined Fidel Castro's 26th of July oh God. revolutionary movement, according to U.S. State Department documents. And I had done all this research. I must have... Uh, Decided not to keep it in here, but one of the hijackers w- went missing for a long time. They showed up again in Miami, but they had like no evidence left. Like they didn't keep any evidence or anything. Oh. So the guy, people were accusing him the rest of his life, and and he he bragged about it apparently to his family. Oh God, and uh, they couldn't never, get him. He never got in trouble for it or anything, and wow. uh, people were pissed at like family members of the deceased so. were upset. Yeah. Yeah. So look that up if you want to know more about that story. That's some crazy shiz. Mitt. And then Tuesday, November 4th, 1958, was the coronation of Pop- Pope John the 23rd. Pope John Paul. Took place in Rome after his throne was carried into St. Peter's Basilica. Right. They carry the throne. And you know who was carrying it? Sexy naked guys shirtless guys probably probably yeah like in that madonna material girl video yeah and then on friday november 7th 1958 albert friedman the producer of the u.s television game show 21 became the first person to be arrested in connection with the tv quiz show scandals oh right i remember there's a movie about that there is yeah so he was indicted for perjury on charges of having knowingly lied under oath to the grand jury uh, about supplying questions or answers to contestants on 21. So when he spoke to the Archive of Te- American Television in 2000, he would only admit that he told a contestant who was a teacher from Columbia University named Charles Van Doren what to study. He just said what to study prior to the shows. He didn't like give them the answers. He just said, study this. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, right. that's what he said oh. then. Uh, and this is all according to the New York Times and the Hollywood Reporter. Mm-hmm. But in 1958, another contestant on 21, Elfrida von Nardroff, she went on to have a long run on the show and earned $220,500 in winnings. But shortly after her appearance on the show, an investigation into quiz shows was begun by Manhattan DA Frank Hogan. The investigation was prompted by a standby contestant who had hoped to be on the television show Dotto. Mm -hmm. That contestant complained to the New York District District Attorney's Office about irregularities. All this is according to the Madison, Wisconsin State Journal. The Manhattan District Attorney's investigation discovered that 21 had been paying some contestants to lose. Mm -hmm. The trouble began when a losing contestant did not receive the compensation that he was promised. And so the man went to the media and revealed the game show scheme. All that, according to the Lancaster Eagle Gazette. So if you're going to pay off yeah, somebody to you lose, gotta, you got to pay them. you got to pay. Yeah, or else. Or you're going to pay. You're going to get found out. In other ways, yeah. So that's when, so he became the first person indicted and arrested in the quiz show scandal on November 7th, 1958. And he was like the, the central figure. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, he... Yeah, actually, Van Doren, the first person I said that he told the uh, what to study, um, said that Friedman tried to extort five grand from him as payment for Friedman helping him win, a charge which Friedman denied. Hmm. But anyway, later on in 1959, he admitted admitted to lying to the grand jury and was indicted for perjury. And that goes on and on. And he ended up uh, having to resign and... and uh, shame and he relocated to london and worked for penthouse and other pornographic publications and he died in 2017 of heart failure yep in california uh november 8th 1958 was a saturday the u.s air force's third consecutive failure of a rocket to the moon happened shortly after 2 30 a.m uh when the third stage of the four stage rocket rocket failed to ignite and then November 10th, the Bossa Nova was born in Rio de Janeiro. Mm. Uh, and it was born with a recording of Chega de Suadade by Joao Gilberto. Oh, my God. <laughs> What's your ring? Joao. 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 No. J O A O. And A's got a squiggly line. How do you pronounce oh, that? Oh, God. I would have looked that one up. Joao. 
Joao Gilberto's recording with Chega de Solo I don't know why we're talking about this. No, I don't either. Anyway, November 11th was a Tuesday, and the supernatural comedy romance film Bell, Book, and Candle premiered in L.A. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. You have? I've heard of you it. You know who's in it? Bell, Book, and Candle? Uh, Angela Lansbury? No, I don't <laughs> no, know. No close. Jimmy Stewart and, oh, and Kim Novak. That's and right. And you know why this is notable? Is it Alfred Hitchcock or something? It was at the Warner Beverly Theater. This was based on a 1950 Broadway play, uh, which was about a witch and the victim of a love spell, and would later be cited by TV producer Saul Sachs as one of two inspirations for the sitcom Bewitched. Oh. If you watch the trailer, it basically looks like Bewitched. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. And then on Saturday, November 15th, we're going to jump all the way to Saturday, where we have a death. Another death. Tyrone Power, a 44-year-old popular American film actor, Mm -hmm. died of a massive heart attack while filming an action scene for the movie Solomon and Sheba in Spain. Have you ever heard of that movie? No. Neither had I, but uh, he had been cast in the lead role of Solomon, uh, and filming was two-thirds complete when he died. And so the part was recast the next day with Yul Brynner. Wow. Refilm all of Power's scenes. Yeah, I guess so. Isn't that crazy? Yes. And then on November 17th, I don't know why I even kept this in here, on we'll Monday, skip it. the Chipmunk song subtitled Christmas Don't Be Late was released. All right. You know, where they, the yes. little guy does the high-pitched. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that it was a, it was done by a comedian, Ross Bagdazarian, who had earlier done the hit Witch Doctor. Oh. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah. Bing, That's right. Bang. Walla, 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 bing, bang. bang. I knew you would finish it for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's what she said. That is what she said. Wait a minute. It is? November 18th was a Tuesday in 1958, and 33 of the 35 crew of the Lake Freighter SS Carl D. Bradley died when it broke up and sank in a storm on Lake Michigan. Oh. That's one of the Great Lakes. The night before, after having made its final scheduled delivery of the season, a cargo of crushed stone at Gary, Indiana, the ship had been on its way to Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Remember mm. Manitowoc? Why that was famous? No. Manitowoc County? No. I don't remember. That's the town where the... Who's the guy that... The Netflix thing that... They think he was falsely imprisoned? That guy with the blonde mustache? Making a murderer? Ma- yeah, making a murderer. Okay. That's that county? Yeah, Manitowoc. Okay. Anyway... It was on its way to Mantuac, and they were all done. It would have been placed in dry rock, and they were done with their trip. But hours before it reached Mantuac, the ship received an order from U.S. Steel to travel to Rogers City, Michigan, for a last-minute order of limestone. At 5.35 in the afternoon, southwest of Michigan's Gull Island, while sailing in a storm, the ship exploded and broke in two. Neither of the two lifeboats on the stern, half of the boat could be lowered to evacuate the 15 sailors who reached the stern side of the deck, and only four crew members were able to reach the life raft on the bow side. Mm. Of the four who got on the raft, two were thrown off into the sea by massive waves, and so two survivors okay. from that crash. It reminds me of Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. To me, it's like... Hard to think about it. It's like that's a great lake. It's not the ocean. That's just right. Lake. You would think you'd survive it, but it's so big of a lake. Yeah. That it's, and the waves are, and the storms up there in the north, in the Great Lakes region where I'm from. I'm mm-hmm. a Great Lakes person. I'm a Great Lakes man from the Great Lakes. That's right. You ever think you marry a guy from the Great Lakes? I I didn't have a clue. I'm a Great Lakes dweller. Yeah. You're from the damn Ozarks. I know. But what are those? Are those even lakes? Yeah, Lake of the Ozarks. The rivers. Yeah, lakes, I think. Yeah. Well, we're lake people. Then uh, th- Thursday, November 20th, 1958, puppeteers Jim Henson and Jane Henson incorporated the Jim Henson Company as Muppets, Inc. Mm. in the U.S., initially to market the characters seen on the Henson's television series, Sam and Friends. I don't know if you've ever seen, like, very, very early <coughs> Jim Henson, but it is very bizarre. I mean, it is, like... Acid trip, bizarre. Well, you know, he was on SNL the first yeah. couple of years. He had that weird, That's those right. weird monsters that were kind of funny. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't funny at all. They were weird. Yeah, but I watched a little bit of Sam 
and Friends, which mm-hmm. I didn't realize that was the first Muppet Show thing. Mm-hmm. And it had Kermit on there. Oh. It was like black and white and it had Kermit and there was all kinds of sock puppets like smoking cigarettes and stuff. Yeah, like, so kinda, inappropriate. Kind of funny, yeah. But he, I mean, he still had that same voice, like, yeah. But I mean, Looney Tunes, they smoke cigarettes and That's it, true. So. Speaking of cigarettes, I'm going to start smoking cigarettes. I know, you keep saying that. It's fun, man. Yeah. I Smoke that. cigarettes, everybody. It stinks, but it's fun. It stinks, but it's fun, and it's terrible for you. Yeah. But everything is now, right? Right, pretty much. Everything is. Okay. Why drag it out? Why drag it out, everybody? As soon as I turn, as soon as I retire, I'm going to start smoking. <laughs> as soon as I have any signs that anything's going to kill me. I was, well, oh, you uh, had yeah. a heart attack. Okay. I'll start smoking. <laughs> Yeah, well, if I can't eat it, good food, if, oh, you can only eat kale from now on, I'm going to start smoking. Well, you know that will exacerbate a heart attack as well, It's cigarette smoking. Yeah. So why am I eating kale? So. Maybe I just won't eat kale. Right. But also smoke. No. I guess once I have nothing else to live for, like once the kids are like, we hate you, we don't want to know you anymore, then I'll do it. When you need somebody to wipe your ass for you. Yeah, that's when I'll start smoking. That's when you need to start smoking. You're right. So you smell That'll really good. That'll be too late. Yep. Well, we got a birthday on November 22nd, 1958. We got a birthday. Hit it, Matt Truman, Eagle Tree. Your favorite actress of all time. Olivia Newton-John. Okay. <laughs> we already did that. Her. She's okay, rest darn in it. Peace. Darn okay, it. she might... Not be your favorite, but... Marilyn Monroe? Okay, she is in your top 20. I think mm-hmm. you like her because you Vivian like... Vivian Lee? Her, mm-hmm. Janet Lee's daughter. Jamie Lee Curtis? Yeah! Daughter of Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. Was born in Santa Monica, California. Oh, okay. Don't you love J- Jamie Lee Curtis? She's all right. Well, I don't know if you know this, but her parents divorced in 1962. Mm-hmm. And after the divorce, her father was not around. And he was not interested in being a father, according to her. Yeah, I don't I don't doubt that. In fact, after her father's death, she learned that she and her siblings had all been cut out of his will. Wasn't he in Manitou? Yes. Yeah, he, he starred in Manitou. He starred in Manitou. Oh, and there's a great stunt scene. See the movie Manitou, everyone. Oh, my God. Really quick. Yeah. All right, this uh, woman Manitou? gets a lump on her neck. In and, the movie Manitou? In the movie Manitou, and she goes to the doctor... And he tells her she's pregnant in her neck. This is a horror movie. And he tells her she's pregnant in her neck. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when she gets, she's ready to give birth. <laughs> neck pregnancy. An old Indian pops out of her neck. <laughs> yeah. And it's evil. And it, yeah. and it, it's a Manitou. It might be the worst film of yes. all time. It's the best to watch but when you're stoned. But I think a lot of people have not heard of it. It's the best thing to watch when you're stoned. It is? How oh my know? God. How do you know? You don't do Ill- illegal drugs. It is hysterical. Yeah, see the movie Manitou if anybody can find it. It's worth it. And Tony Curtis is it is like the star of it, but he's old, an old man. It's like when he was washed up. Yeah, it's and the best. The best scene is when <laughs> the old lady falls down the stairs. Oh my god! And and it's stunt- very obviously like a twenty five year old man. <laughs> yeah, the stunt six man. Foot four. Yeah, this lady is like four feet tall, lady, and the stunt man is like six two. You know, and he did <laughs> popped a wig on him and threw him down the stairs. And the dress doesn't even fit him as he's falling. Down there's the like stairs. a and there's a part where he's like completely turns face front the camera. Yeah, you can see so it's funny, hysterical. Oh my god, Manatee's the greatest. It's almost so bad that you'd think they made it bad on purpose, but I don't think they did. There's one scene where he's supposed to be Manitou is supposedly it skinned him, and skinned really him alive. Yeah. It's it's he's in like a, like a red, red unitard. Red <laughs> it looks like a sweatshirt, <laughs> a red, red wet sweatshirt. Yeah. Red, yeah. Unitard. Anyway, Tony Curtis is in that. He's the father Jamie of Jamie Lee, Lee Curtis, Curtis who's born this day. Right. Uh but uh, I don't know if you know that she. Attended the elite Harvard Westlake School, home of the Wolverines, and notable alumni include Mindy Cohn from Facts of Life. Oh. But here's the thing if I ever do that notable alumni show, Jamie Lee Curtis is going to start it off because she also went to Beverly Hills High School in LA, home of the Normans, with Betty White slash Corbin Burnson and Richard Dreyfus, Nick Cage, and Carrie Fisher all went to that school. I, not at the same time. Not at the same time, but they're all notable alumni. And. She, so she went to a third high school. She graduated in 1976 from the school's called 
Chode Rose, Rosemary Hall in oh. Wallingford, Connecticut. It's called Chode, home of the wild boars. And, and the notable alumni include Bruce Dern, Buck Henry, and Paul Giamatti. So she went to three different high schools with tons of famous people. So it'll all revolve around Jamie Lee Curtis because I think she's like the Kevin Bacon of the notable alumni show I want to do. Oh just talk God. about high schools. And that nobody will listen to. I will listen to it. You'll Me and be the, the dogs. only one. Me and the dogs. Nobody and gives Rich a Helen. fuck. Nobody cares about this at all. Nobody. But yeah, that's there. You go. That's uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. She okay. She studied law at her mother's alma mater and dropped we, we, out. We move on. And then November twenty fourth, nineteen fifty eight, was a Monday. The CBS TV anthology Desilu Playhouse presented a show called The Time Element. A teleplay by Rod Serling that would lead to the American Network's decision to broadcast a weekly series of Serling's productions, the classic science fiction show, The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. So this is a precursor of that. How about that? How about that? And then we'll jump all the way to November 30th, 1958, which is a Sunday, and British actor Gareth Jones died during the live performance of the play Underground on television. Oh, no. Although his death took place off camera while a makeup artist was preparing him for the next oh, scene. Oh, so he wasn't on stage. It wasn't on screen, but it was a live show on being telecast. Ironically, oh, no. 35-year-old actor was portraying the role of a man with a weak heart in the drama about people trapped in the rubble of a subway tunnel. Well, they weakened to Bernie's him out there? and So, like... well, I guess Gareth... Uh, uh, he performed his role as Carl Norman in the first of two scenes before he died on the presentation mm-hmm. on ITV's Armchair Theater. But he complained of not feeling well when he walked off stage. When it was clear that he was not going to be coming back, the other actors ad-libbed his scene, including delivering some of the lines that he would have spoken. Hmm. So I don't know if they said, oh, he died or something. But, right. Uh, anyway, it was, I don't I wonder if you can see this anywhere. Uh, it was uh, Underground on Television. Was the name of the thing, I guess. So, and that ends November, and then we're going to jump into December. But do you think? Let me go check. Oh, it's only been twenty-one minutes. Oh, okay, we're good then. I think we're good. Um, so let's jump into December. We have a lasagna, a lasagna cooking, baking, yep, sort of. It's December first, nineteen fifty-eight. It was a Monday. A fire killed ninety-two students and three teachers at the Our Lady of Angels Parochial School in Chicago. The fire started in a cardboard trash barrel in a stairway, forty minutes before classes were to end for the day. Oh no! Because the school is filled with combustible materials and fire yes. doors and alarms were inadequate back then. The fire spread quickly on the building's second floor. Most of the students, seventy-eight, oh. who died, had been in three classrooms. The fire resulted in burned to death. But this seventy eight. Well, a lot of them had smoke inhalation. Yeah. Um, but the fire this fire resulted in numerous reforms and fire prevention in schools. So it kinda Yeah was the catalyst for a lot of You'd hope regulations. So. But yeah, you can read the whole story online if you look this up. The Our Lady of Angels Parochial School fire in Chicago. Mm-hmm. It's horrific what happened. Like they even have two three girls who noticed the fire and went to tell others. Two of them didn't make it, one of them did. There's like glass, like every time a window would shatter, more air would come in and the fire would get bigger. The floors were like waxed with like super flammable oh things. So it was just like everything was just like flammable then. And then nobody, it just was a perfect storm of things. Like the principal wasn't anywhere. The fire alarms didn't work. What, the one that finally did work wasn't connected to a uh, fire place, a uh, uh, fire engine company or anything. There's lots of bad stuff. So yeah. just read that. But for time, we're going to move on to December 3rd, 1958, which was a Wednesday, which I thought this might be yours, because American gangster Gus Greenbaum, operator of the Riviera Hotel and Casino in Vegas, was found brutally murdered, oh. along with his wife Bess, in his home in Phoenix, Arizona. The victim of an apparent mob hit after the Riviera had been losing money while Greenbaum was supporting a gambling and narcotics habit, he was found in his bed nearly decapitated with a butcher knife, and his wife was found on a sofa with a throat slit. The crime was never solved. And that, my friends, brings us to December 7th, thank you, which is dun, a dun, dun. I'm going to talk about the Martin family disappearance. The Martin family disappearance. That's right, and I got my information from an article on all that's interesting.com. Okay. Factsology.com. Okay. Wikipedia. 
is Faxology spelled F A C T S? Yes, and then H O L O G Y. There's an H in the middle oh, of fax- it. Faxology. Faxology. Like it's a schoology or oh, almost kind of, but okay. there's only one O, so With I don't see. No I'll show it to you. Faxology. Okay, yeah, just send it to me. So on the afternoon of yeah. December 7th, yeah. 1958, five members of the Martin family piled into their Ford station wagon. Okay. Christmas was around the corner. They decided they're going to drive to the Columbia River Gorge to collect greenery to decorate their house. Okay. Is that a... Okay. Like for the holidays. Sure. That you know. seems like a fine thing to do. So they decided, you know, it looked like they were just going to be back shortly. They were not going to go long. They left dishes in the sink. There was laundry in the washing yeah, machine. Sounds like a tr- family tradition that you would do. It sounds right. like no harm could come of this. But they never came back. What? So at some point on their drive that winter day, they disappeared. Oh, no. Never to be seen alive again. Oh, no. For years, Poor detectives family. tried to crack the case of the missing family of five. Did the okay. Columbia River claim the lost Martin family? Or did the family's oldest child and sole survivor, Donald Martin, have them murdered? Oh. So by most accounts, the Martins were a happy... A One survivor of the yes, family? Yes. Oh. He was like an adult. Okay. By most accounts, the Martins were a happy and close-knit family. They all lived in the suburbs of Portland, Oregon, okay. and except for Donald. He was... Uh, 28 at the time, and he was in the Navy, but he was stationed in New York, so he wasn't even oh, so he around. Wasn't, he wasn't with them no. on this trip? Okay. No. So the night before he disappeared, 54-year-old Kenneth Martin put on a Santa suit and attended a Christmas party where he handed out candy canes to his neighbors, which okay. was a family tradition as well. Oh. So then the, fo- the next day, um, he still hadn't put the Santa suit away, so it still was laid out by the time they left for their Sunday drive. Okay. His wife, 48-year-old Barbara Martin, had left a load of laundry in the machine, which was reported by the Charlie Project. Their oldest daughter, Barbie, was a 14-year-old freshman at the local high school. Okay. I wonder what the mascot was. Shush. (laughs) She and her younger sisters, Virginia, 13, and Sue, 11, piled into the back of the cream and red colored car for the afternoon trip. They made at least two stops before they disappeared. They were seen eating at a restaurant in Hood River, Oregon. That was about 60 miles from Portland. Okay. And they purchased gas at Cascade Locks, which was about 40 miles up the Columbia River from home. But then after they filled up the tank, they just vanished. And so then when they never returned to Portland, their friends called the police, but there weren't very many clues. I Um, would say there's no, like... They couldn't Car find crashes it. or anything. Or they looked. They that, that looked everywhere, and they couldn't find a trace or even the station wagon. They couldn't find. Huh. Um, <clears throat> the Medford Mail Tribune reported that the first clue arrived in the Martin family's mailbox two weeks after they disappeared. It was a gas station receipt showing that Kenneth Martin had signed for five gallons of gas on the day of their disappearance. Okay. No money had been removed from the Martin family's bank account since. The receipt led authorities to Cascade Locks, which was the last place the family was seen. Okay. But when the discovery turned up no new helpful information, it seemed like another dead end. Well, if there's no money missing, there's no motivation. Right. So there was all these calls and letters coming in with tips, like sightings of people and all this stuff. One woman even called in to say she'd had a vision the family was in water by a totem pole. But none of these tips brought police any closer. So then... um, in February 1959, okay, they um, the authorities had continued to scour the forests within like 50 miles. Yeah, um, with like dogs and things. Right, but then in February 1959, they got a clue, which was a set of tire tracks on a bluff overlooking the Columbia River that matched the family's 1954 station wagon. Uh oh, and tire alarmingly. They they seemed like they ran off the cliff. Oh, my gosh. So they're wondering, did they tumble into the river while they were backing up or something? Yeah. So then they searched the river then? So they did. They lowered the water level behind the dam, but the search, they couldn't find anything. So then months go by before the next break in the case. Then in May 1959, yeah. more than five months after they went missing, authorities found the bodies of Virginia and Sue floating in the Columbia River. Oh, they were in the river. And the cause of their death was officially listed as drowning, but... Virginia Martin's body was found with a mysterious hole in her skull. Really? And because the girl's bodies had been decomposing for so long, an autopsy could not definitively reveal what might have caused it. Really? And meanwhile, Kenneth, Barbara, and Barbie remained missing. 
Huh. And they wondered, were they still out there somewhere? Had they died too? Did you say Kenneth, Barbara, and Barbie? Yeah, Barbie is the daughter. She's like Barbara. Oh, Barbara's the mom. The mom. Uh oh. So only one member of the Martin family survived, which was Donald Martin, the oldest child. He had been stationed in New York across the country from Portland. Well, he, he didn't survive this. He wasn't with them. He's surviving. Right. Yeah, he's, he's the only one alive. But um, he everyone did... that was in that car is gone. Right. And he did not return home for his uh, sister's memorial service, though he did come home to settle his family's estate. Huh. He said, I know of no one who had murdered my folks or no reason for it, but I don't see how it could have been an accident. He told Detective Walter Gravon. Well, she's got a hole in her head. Gravin spent years trying to unravel the Lost Martin family, and he came to an unsettling conclusion. Donald might have been involved in their disappearance. That's the that's the, the surviving guy. Right. So in his notebook, Gravin scrawled, it had to be planned out by blank. He scratched out the name of the suspect above the words. No one else was with a motive. And according to one investigative investigator's computer enhancement, the scratched out name of it was Donald. Huh. Another piece of evidence linked to Donald to the disappearance, a bloody gun found near a stolen car that had been abandoned in Cascade Locks where the Martins were last seen alive. Huh. It was completely coated with dried blood from whatever they had clubbed, explained Bonnie Cox, whose husband found the gun. They had clubbed something to death, apparently, So, because there's blood all over the gun. It's obviously yeah. they used it to beat something to death. So, maybe... so the Coxes turned the gun over to the local sheriff, but... The sheriff never processed it for evidence for some oh, weird no. reason. So then the detectives realized that the gun had a surprising connection to Donald Martin. A few years earlier, Donald had worked at a local sporting goods store before he was fired for allegedly stealing goods, including the handgun found near where his family vanished. Really? So, with, um, so he stole that gun? Yeah, from a store. With the case turning cold, Detective Graven wrote in his wait, notes... Wait, wait. How did the case turn cold if they connected the gun to him? That was that well, they, they can't do anything. They never process the gun for evidence, so they can't use it. Sheesh. That sheriff dropped the ball. So, but it's not cold. I mean, they know who did it, right? Well, Detective Graven wrote in his notes, even though I can get no cooperation from anyone, there's no murder that can't be solved. But he never solved the case of the Lost Martin family. He died in 1988. Donald Martin died in 2004. Huh. More than 60 years after the Martins vanished, their disappearance remains unsolved. Wow. So they wonder if... It could be that Kenneth Martin, he just accidentally backed over the bluff, plunged him into the river, hmm. or something with Donald Martin. Or, or well, they found the bloody gun near the... Near the... The stolen car. The car. And so, who knows? With, <clears throat> without new evidence... Yeah. And with the three members of the family still missing... They never found the other three, huh? Nope. That's crazy. I know. Huh. So that's the case. That's a head scratcher. I can't believe there's not been more things. That's done. a nut scratcher. That's a nut scratcher. <laughs> Doesn't that mean you're bored with the nut scratcher? Yeah, I think. Well, I guess we should go eat dinner and then we'll yes. come back and finish the rest of this. That sounds like a plan, Stan, because Audrey's calling. She is. Anyway. Meanwhile, you listeners. Meanwhile, can... at <laughs> the Hall of Justice. Sorry. I accept your apology. Our listeners, while we're eating dinner, can listen to... The dulcet tones of... Dulcet motherfucking tones of this ad for... Oh, my God. There's not definitely the not, not going to be any dulcet tones. Or the gruff and loud show. Or I should advertise something else. Something else kind of, oh, you can buy merch uh, at Redbubble. That's what I should tell people, where they can buy American Timeline's merch. Yeah. At Redbubble. Hello. Or History for Jerks. Go to historyforjerks.com and you'll see a lovely, very diverse couple wearing American Timelines merch. Just click on them and you can purchase it all. And be done with you. And be done with it. Well, American Time Heads, thanks for listening. And now that you're done purchasing all of your purchases from historyforjerks.com and Redbubble, uh, let's get back to the show, shall we? The real meat of why you're here. Let's jump right back into it. Uh, that was great, Amy. Thanks for the mystery. And Amy's in pain right now. She's sorry. Got her uh, nipples stuck my, in something. The, like me to my palm in the my yeah. headphones. <laughs> yeah, you need to. Got to be smarter than the headphones. You need to wear safety, safety gloves gear. and goggles when we do this podcast. December tenth. I thought you might know this too. I thought this might be what you were going to cover. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the WKFL cult? No. 
It stands for Wisdom, Knowledge, Faith, and Love. Mm -hmm. It was a cult uh, in Chatsworth, California. On December 10th, 1958, there was a suicide bombing at the cult. Uh, Two suicide bombers killed themselves and eight other people after setting off a blast. Wait a minute. They killed themselves and eight other people? Yeah. Or they killed themselves and eight other people? E-I-G-H-T, the number of eight. Yeah. That like, makes it very different. Yeah, yeah. I guess you would say, yeah, you would think they might have, if they're in a cult, they might eat people. They kill them. I guess that wouldn't make sense, though, if they killed themselves. They first. killed 10 people total uh, after setting off a blast at the Fountain of the World Monastery. The two men, Ralph Muller and Peter Kamenoff, were both former members of the Fountain of the World cult and had decided to kill the cult leader, Krishna Venta, whom they accused of embezzlement and having an affair with their wives. In their quest to, quote, bring Krishna to justice, Muller and Kamenov killed themselves along with Venta and seven bystanders who died in the resulting fire that burned down the monastery and an adjacent dormitory. See, Venta was born Francis Frank Herman Pinkovic. Probably Pinkovic is how you say it. Probably Pinkovic. Uh, Pinkovic, P-E-N-C-O-V-I-C, Pinkovic, like Yankovic. Yeah, yeah. He had claimed that he was Jesus Christ and that he had been born 240,000 years earlier on the planet Neophrates. Of course. Yes. He was, but in reality, he was born to Jewish immigrants in San Francisco in 1911, and he spent the Great Depression as a hobo, riding the rails under a plethora of aliases. During the early years of the U.S.'s involvement in World War II, he was arrested for writing threatening letters to President Roosevelt. He did nine months in jail for petty larceny and spent a month at the California State Mental Hospital in Camarillo. It was also revealed that his frequent trips nationwide and abroad to spread the word of the foundation uh, were interrupted by detours to opulent casinos in Vegas. Someone snapped a photo of him alongside famous gambler Nick the Greek Dandalos just before Krishna lost almost $3,000 at craps, and the foundation paid the debt. Mm. Uh, so anyway, after a while, they they kind of got upset. These two <clears> other <throat> members of the cult that he was banging their wives, uh, and uh, they started questioning, like, why? How come the most of the WKFL followers are young females, including at least one ex model? How come? That's a good question. Even though Krishna had a wife. He chose to bed most nights with a random sister in his personal station wagon. Oh, geez, a religious person that's a pervert. Yeah. So there's a shock. Yeah, what a surprise. It's a crazy cult. Yeah. Um anyway, so then they decided to get revenge and uh one brother noted that a heated conversation stopped abruptly. Uh that he noticed them arguing, the two guys arguing with Krishna. And when they saw him, he, this bystander excused himself and left. And he walked about one eighth of a mile before an enormous explosion lifted the top of the monastery. Wow. The enclosed rock walls of the canyon amplified the blast, which was heard more than 20 miles away. A woman who lived a mile away was blown out of bed by the shockwave, apparently. Woo! Yep. The shattered explosion jarred us from our sleep, recalled Krishna's son Sharva, 11, who was in the boys' dormitory. The roof fell in on top of us. Everything seemed to catch on fire. Oh our God. beds, the walls, our clothes, and all our possessions. It hardly seemed like no more than five minutes had passed after we left the dormitory that it was burned completely to the ground. Jeez. An exquisite irony, the engine room door of the nearest volunteer fire station was blown off its hinges, holding up first responders trying to reach the fire, which eventually chewed through nearly 150 acres. They did say that where this commune was, it's kind of like a hippie commune. Like, they were really nice people. Like, every time people would uh, get broken down on the nearby, nearby, nearby highway, they would stop and help them and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But they were these weirdos in robes and long beards and stuff. <clears throat> so anyway, hmm. uh Afterwards, although rumors persisted for weeks that Krishna had cheated death, his dental plate and a piece of jawbone were identified. Boom. Uh, the FBI also identified part of a hand and a single thumb belonging to his killers. 
Uh, the survivors buried their master's remains in a potter's grave in North Hollywood's Valhalla Cemetery. They said, we are trying very hard to react to this as Master would want us to. A pilgrim named Sister Mary told the press that it is cheerful. It, it is to be cheerful and positive, for mourning is negative. That's one thing he taught them, I guess. Uh, well, that's nice. And one of the, one of the uh, members of this cult, because it kind of fizzled out by the 80s, mm-hmm. uh, had moved to Chicago and became the guru for the Seekers, a UFO doomsday cult. Mm-hmm. You ever heard of that? No. Um, I have not. Yeah, there you go. And then a- another two that were in this cult end up becoming members of Jim Jones's cult. Oh, well, yeah. The People's Temple cult. So once in a cult, it's hard to quit. It's hard to quit ye. It's hard to quit when you have extreme... You know Jenny Tom... Jenny Thomas was in a cult. Yeah, she's still in a cult. I, know. I mean, the Trump, the Trump thing is, a, is pretty a cult. much a cult. Yeah, um, a lot of this was I got from laist dot com, uh, but from an article by Matthew Dewerston. You can read that article. It's called "The Bizarre Story Behind the Suicide Bombing of a SoCal Cult." And then on December eleventh, we have another birthday. Hit it, true boo. <laughs> Frank Farana Jr. was born. He's an American heavy metal bassist. Do you know who that is? Frank Farana Jr.? No. Frank Carlton Serafino Farana Jr. is his full name. Partially raised by his single mother, Deanna Richards, and by his grandparents after his father left the family. Farana, Nikki Six, later moved in with his grandparents after his mother abandoned him. Mm. Then he relocated several times while living his, with his grandparents. But then he was growing up in Jerome, Idaho, home of Katie Neff, friend of the show, our friend Katie Neff. That's right. Jerome, Idaho. Uh, his youth, He was a troubled youth. He became a teenage vandal, and he broke into neighbors' homes and shoplifted. He was expelled from school for selling drugs. His grandparents sent him to live with his mother in Seattle, where he went to Roosevelt High School, home of the Rough Riders. Notable alumni include Sir Mix-a-Lot. Oh, Nikki Six and Sir Mix-a-Lot went to the same high school, oh, and man. you all know it, the Rough Riders. And that brings us to December 13th, a Saturday, when the newly created NASA Space Agency made its first launch of an animal into space, sending a squirrel monkey named Gordo to an an altitude of 300 miles on a Jupiter rocket. But Gordo endured a 10G force and floated weightlessly inside the capsule for 8.3 minutes. Then he endured reentry at 40 Gs and 10,000 miles per hour. Telemetry showed that Gordo survived the forces and in good condition, indicating that a human being could. Except for all the PTSD. But now, you know, we knew that a human being could endure a launch and return to Earth. Unfortunately, after the spacecraft splashed down on the Atlantic Ocean, the recovery team was unable to locate it after a six hour search, and Gordo was lost at sea. Oh my God. He just fucking starved him. Just left him. Yep. Jesus Christ. Horrible animal abuse in the 50s. All right, hold on. I got to go get that. Make America great again. That's going to take us all the way to, well, I'll just really quickly mention on Christmas Day that year, Ricky Henderson and Alana Miles were both born. You know who, those, who they are? And Ricky Henderson is a play, a ball player, right? Yeah. I can't believe you know that. You love Ricky Henderson? I don't know anything else about him. December 28th, 1958 was a Sunday. In American football, the Baltimore Colts beat the New York Giants 23-17. to to win the NFL championship game, the New York Football Giants. The first to go into sudden death overtime was this game. The event telecast on the NBC network would be described later as the greatest game ever played. As one author would note, 60 years later, the 1958 title game was a seminal moment in pro football history, laying the foundation with the American public for the ultra-popular spectacle that pro football would become and for the marriage of the sport with television. That same day that the greatest game ever played was played, the popular Japanese adventure film The Hidden Fortress, directed by Akira Kurosawa, premiered in theaters. You know why that's notable? No. Because George Lucas would later acknowledge that that film was one of the major influences on Star Wars. It gave him a boner. It gave him a boner. <laughs> and then uh, 
And that's it. I mean, unless you want to end with the the birth of Baby New Earth on December thirty first, nineteen fifty eight. No. Baby New Earth. You know who that is? Yes. Who? Was it she on? For um, what was it? Cheers. Yeah, she was on Cheers. Yeah, she played Lilith. And in her youth, she rebelled against authority, being placed in custody for smoking marijuana when she was 13. Go, girl. Little bit about Baby Newworth you didn't know. Baby Newworth loves the weed, y'all. All right. It's time to get out of here, Chuck Thanks Berry. for listening, American Time Thank Heads. Thank you, everybody. Time Heads, we love you. We do love you. Sexually, all well, of he's, you. He's a little bit weird. Okay, non-sexually. We just love you and appreciate As you. As pals. Yeah, join our Patreon and give us a thousand dollars a day. Oh my God! We don't have a Patreon. Right. We do have a Patreon. I just don't know where it is or how. Oh to my get God! It. <laughs> All right. I love you. Bye. Peace. Ego Trip is the greatest band of all time. Buy their music.